This is chapter 20, video two. Let's launch. Okay, so in this video, we're going to do a resolve tax issues as applicable to partnership formation and other acquisitions of partnership interests, including gain recognition to partners and tax basis for partner relationships. Okay, so acquiring a partnership interest uh, when it's uh, you know when partners are formed. So let me tell you. Okay, so from a practical standpoint, how are partnerships done? <laughs> Hi, partner. That's exactly how they can be done. Ever seen the movie Paint Your Wagon? And by the way, if you haven't seen Paint Your Wagon and you want to see a young Clint Eastwood, uh, he actually does comedy. <laughs> I mean, let's be honest. Uh, comedy in a, in a, in, in Clint Eastwood movie would be pretty awesome. Um, so anyways, what I've done is I've gone ahead and I've done this and I've looked at that and I've, and, and I've, I've looked at that movie. And Paint Your Wagon is probably one of the coolest movies I've ever, I mean, it's, you know, you got Lee Marvin, you got Clint Eastwood, um, you know, it's about a bunch of gold diggers and, and, and they're going to go mine gold. And of course, you know, they're partners and, you know, back in the old days, partnerships were basically two people spitting in each other's hands and shaking hands and saying, how do you do duty partner? Well, if you take a look at partnership tax law, it's kind of the same thing. All you have to do is say, Two people who are engaged in, a, in an activity in order to engage in profit. Two or more people, that's all it takes. And if you get four or five people who get together and they shake hands after spitting in each other's hands, not that I'd recommend that during COVID time, by the way. Um, but at the same time, if you do this, you have formed a partnership. And congratulations, you've done. Now, um, as, as, as legal structures have become more sophisticated lately, there's actually um, a lot of processes you can do to register partnership names. Um, you know, a very common way that we do partnerships nowadays is really just form an LLC. And that is a, a, that's a government method for, for doing registration of certain entities in order to receive asset liability protection. And that actually, I think, is probably the best way to go. General partnerships are generally pretty dangerous, no pun intended. Um, but you know, you can have, you, you can do a limited partnership, but they have different aspects of it. Like I said, we didn't really talk about this in the class, but generally, if you're going to do a general partnership, all it takes is, you know, a spit and handshake, you're done. Um, now you can go register it and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, of course, one thing that we do with our clients is go register for an LLC, go register for an LP or whatever it is that you're going to do. And then we can kind of talk about how we're going to do some of this stuff. Okay. So when it's formed, you know, the, the partnerships uh, the, now, okay, and actually, let me back up. So now we're going to talk about what the slides are saying, what it's, you know, what happens when a partnership is formed. And here's what happens. Two people get together and they say, we're going to form a partnership. Usually, <laughs> I'm saying, gen and these are broad generalizations, um, partnerships are going to be formed because one person has money and one person has brains. Or two people have brains and two people have money. Uh, and what I'm saying in, in a, in a two-person partnership, generally speaking, one person has something that the other person doesn't have, and they're going to want to get together to do this. Or you may have a situation where four friends who know each other have decided that, hey, if we work together and we collaborate together, we can do this great and wonderful thing. And as a result of which, we're going to make, we're going to make a lot of money. And so we're going to do all this stuff. And so they get together and do a partnership. Partnerships are like marriage. Very easy to get into, very hard to get out of. If you're married after 20 some odd years and you've accumulated so many assets together and you decide to get a divorce, it's a painful process to go through. And partnerships, it's kind of the same way. And that's one reason why when a company comes to us and says, we want you to do our partnership tax return, my first words out of my mouth is go get an operating agreement, get an operating agreement, get an operating agreement, get an operating agreement. And most of the time they listen to me and it's actually a really good thing. And if you think of what, what is an operating agreement, think of it as a prenup. It's basically, we're about to form a partnership. This is what my responsibilities are. It's what your responsibilities are. If you do something that's out of your responsibilities, I have the right to terminate the partnership and do this, do that, do it. No, no, no. It's also going to identify the important partners. Um, so say you have four people, you want one to be the managing partner that's kind of making key decisions. You might want to have one person who's the tax matters partner. And then you got the one friend who actually understands something about finances. You say, well, you're going to do all our books. You know, and all that sort of stuff. So, you, so those are the various roles and jobs that are going to end up getting played in here so that it allows you to form the partnership and 
be correct. Now, from this standpoint, when you actually do the partnership, you'll transfer in cash, property, or anything else. Now, you can do services in exchange for a partnership interest. There is a little bit of a tax conundrum that happens as a result of that, but we'll talk about that as we move on. Partnership rights. So it's a right to receive a share in a partnership assets. If the partnership were to liquidate, it's called a capital interest. Or you can have a right or obligation to receive future profits, and that's called a profit interest. Okay, what's the difference tax-wise? If we form a partnership and I put $100,000 in and you put $100,000 in, we each have $100,000 of capital interest. Okay? If we form a partnership and I put in $200,000 and you put in nothing, we have a, I have a capital interest of 100% for me, 0% for you. Now, does that mean that you can't receive any of the profits? Absolutely not. I always say the partnerships are extremely flexible. They're kind of like, you know, the person, you know, if you've ever been to a circus, the, you know, Mr. Rubber Man who can like, you know, contort their bodies into like hundreds of different ways. I can't do it anymore. I used to be able to do like the pop dancing, you know, back in, uh, back in the eighties when that was real popular. But these guys, you know, you know, these guys at the circus could, uh, you know, contort themselves in different parts. Now, partnership is just as flexible. I can have a $200,000 interest that's 100% of the capital interest, and we can do 50-50. Does that make economic sense? And the answer is yes. Maybe you're the smart person. You know what you're doing, and I'm just the money guy. I'm putting in $200,000. You're putting in the brains. It's a perfect marriage. You know, there are people who actually get married, you know, you know, it's like it's like in the good old days. You know, I want my I want my son to marry up into a, a a better family. You know, and I'm talking like the way old days. You know, you know, and and especially you know in some other cultures where you know they'd marry their sons into higher families just so that they could you know get a better name for themselves. They're bringing they're probably bringing good looks and and other things. They're not bringing the money. The money's coming from the other half. Okay, so so that's that's kind of how this works out. Now partnerships would contribute services. Uh, frequently receive only a profit interest, and there's a reason for that. There's actually a court case where the IRS got itself. I'm gonna got a portion of its body handed to itself. Let's just leave it at that. And they tried to say that they had to pay a tax on a profit interest transferred, and the IRS ta- and I think it was tax court actually did this. Came back to the IRS and said, "Hey, you can't do that because we don't know what the profit interest is valued at, and they're going to be taxed on their profit interest going forward. So it's not like you know, in a capital interest, if I give, so if I we can't get that same scenario. I bring in two hundred thousand dollars, and you bring in none, and I want to make it a fifty fifty percent uh, capital interest. Effectively, I've given hundred thousand dollars to the other partner." Okay, and the IRS will say that is a taxable event because what happens is that is a tax once, tax at the source. It'll never be taxed again. We can determine it. It's very determinable, and we can determine its value. Therefore, it's going to be taxed that way. Now, with regards to the profits interest, how much am I going to have next year? How much am I going to have the year after that? How much am I going to have the year after that? If you know that, you should get out of partnership. You should get into stock trades because you're going to be more valuable there. You can't predict that. The IRS can't predict that, and that's why it's not taxable to receive a profit interest direct, directly out front. Contribution of property. So depending on the transaction, realized gains or losses from the exchange of contributed property for a partnership interest is either partially or fully deta- deferred for taxes. So I contribute, say I have a piece of land, and we're going to build an office building on this. I have a piece of land that's worth $700,000. I bought it for $200,000 many, many, many years ago. There's a built-in gain of $500,000. So what happens is I will contribute the land to the partnership. My basis in the partnership that I receive back, basis given is basis received. Remember, basis given is basis received. Basis given is basis received. Basis given is basis received. All right, so I give basis of $200,000. I receive $200,000 basis in my partnership. My partner, who contributes seven hundred thousand dollars cash because I put in seven hundred fifty seven hundred thousand dollars of land, he wants fifty fifty on this. He's going to put in uh, uh, seven hundred thousand dollars. His basis in the partnership is now going to be seven hundred thousand dollars because basis of cash is fair market value. Okay, so you got to understand that how that works out. But I, in my case, I have contributed land that is subject to. A um, that is actually subject to a built-in gain. We'll talk about built-in gains later on. 
So similar to the rationale for permitting tax deferral when corporations are formed, we didn't talk too much about this because I, I think we skipped over that chapter. But chapter 351, when, you, when you're forming a corporation, you contribute assets and in exchange uh, you receive stock as long as 80% of the people – as long as 80% of the ownership is making contribution at that time and receive for only stock, they will have no tax effects as a result of that. And if you want to take a look at that, you want to look up uh, code section 351 uh, in your textbook. It'll actually have a pretty good description of that for that. Uh, it follows the aggregate theory of partnership taxation. All right, so gain loss recognition. Generally, neither partnerships nor partners recognize uh, gains or losses when they contribute property. That's true. Again, you go basis given is basis received, and so you're going to receive that. I know one of these days you guys are going to wake up in the middle of the night. <gasps> basis given is basis received. Basis given is basis received. And then, you know, as, as long as you don't start turning your neck around and, and, and like, you know, devil in a blue dress all over again. Um, but the most important thing that you got to understand is you're not going to pay any gains on that by giving that property. Now, if that partnership turns around and does a sale almost immediately, you are going to have a gain attached to it, and, and that's because of the built-in gain rules that we're going to talk about later on. All right, definition of property includes a wide range of both tangible and intangible assets, but not services. So contribution of services does not mean that you are getting basis for those services. Okay, so if I, you know, as, if I join a partnership and I say I'm going to do, uh, you know, all the tax services for, for the partnership as part of that, uh, therefore, I want another two percent, you know, interest in the partnership. That's not that I don't get any basis as a result of giving that. Okay. Uh, so the general rule facilitates, you know, the contribution of property with built-in gains, and it uh, discourages, uh, you know, contribution of properties with built-in losses. Um, because here's what's the thing: if I have a piece of land that I bought for two hundred thousand dollars, is worth fifty, and I contribute it and the partnership sells it, it's going to get the losses, not me. And so that's why, that's why it's, uh, it's going to cause a little bit of a problem if I decide to do that. Partner's initial tax basis is required to be compute the initial tax basis when the, so uh, when they sell their um, partnership interest. Now, generally the way the tax basis is going to go, there's actually a lot of things that go into it, but for the most part, um, you know, basically what's going to happen is, you know, I contribute cash $200,000 into my partnership. Say I, I contribute $200,000, the other partner contributes $200,000. So we both put in $400,000, $200,000 a piece. The company makes a million dollars of income that next year. I get $500,000, she gets $500,000. What ends up happening is my basis is going to go from $200,000 to $700,000 because I'm going to pay taxes on that $500,000 of income, Okay. If I then take a distribution from that partnership of $400,000, I'm going to drop from $700,000 to $300,000 because I've taken a basis. I mean, I've taken a, a distribution from that. All that has to be calculated and maintained. Now, <clears throat> how do I say things without getting into trouble? Um, I've worked at a couple places that, let's say, don't do that. Okay. Uh, usually what ends up happening is um, there's a lot of places where calculating the basis is a pain in the butt. It's a lot of extra work. They don't want to do it. And if the client's not going to pay for it, they're not going to do it. Okay, I get that. However, if, you know, what's going to end up happening is when they when they sell the partnership and they and you go back to them and say, we got to recalculate basis, the first question they're going to ask is, why weren't you doing this in the first place? I paid you all this money to do my tax returns. You should have been doing this. Um, my personal opinion is if I have to spend, you know, 15, 20 minutes on, on, on working on their basis numbers to make sure that everything goes up and down correctly. So what, you know, it's 20, it's 20 minutes or something like that, that when I deliver their tax return later on, it's good. Now I tend to be the kind of guy who probably gets undercharged for his work because I just want to do things right. You know, and again, that comes down to that integrity first, uh, image that I have that I that I ask you to have in this class. I know we're coming to the end of class, but remember, we've still got to have integrity first as you move forward. Okay. So the computation of the initial tax basis when they have debt. So each partner must include their share of the partnership's debt in calculating their tax base. You know, I, I know that we're talking about this. I go watch my other video. It is going to be so much better for the, us to to explain this. I I mean I think uh, you know the, I'm going to talk to this stuff. But we're really going to hit the scratching the surface part. If you go watch my video series on, um, on uh, you know, the tax, the, the limitations, 
they're going to have all of this. They're going to talk about, and I've, and I've, I've got, like I said, I've got videos that I'll put up on this. I'll, I'll try to add this to the, um, um, add this to the, um, the, the YouTube video so that you have quick reference to it. But in the fact of the matter is there, you know, so when you calculate it, you know, when you put in, de in debt, so, so here's the thing. I have that partnership. I put in $200,000. He puts in two, she puts in $200,000 and we have $400,000 in our partnership. We go out and we borrow $600,000. So we get a million dollars into the partnership so that we can go out and we can buy the materials that are necessary for us to do this. What's going to happen is that my basis gets increased by my share of the responsibility for that loan. Recourse or non-recourse, doesn't matter. That's going to increase basis. My at-risk amount is going to increase by the recourse value of that. So if we go to the go to the bank and we say to the bank, I'm going to borrow $600,000. Bank says, you're putting in $400,000. Um, Kevin, we know you, we like you, we trust you, but we're going to need a little more. We're going to ask you to personally be liable for your portion of this of this debt. And I kind of go, okay, fine. So I'm liable for six hundred thousand. I'm sorry, for three hundred thousand dollars of a six hundred thousand dollar loan. That is going to increase my basis from two hundred thousand to five hundred thousand, and it's also going to increase my at risk amount from two hundred thousand to five hundred thousand. Now, without that guarantee, my debt basis still goes up to five hundred thousand, but my at risk amount goes down to two hundred thousand. When we were talking about at risk limitations, when we talked about investments, that's the big difference. And I'm not going to lie to you, I've, I've run into some people in the industry who don't know that, you know, because again, they're doing monkey see, monkey do. They're not doing this. Let's actually read this and figure this stuff out. I didn't actually realize this till probably about three years into the system, because all they told me was, well, you can't take you know, if it's non recourse, you can't take a, you can't take it against that. Why? I, uh, you know, whatever. Uh, it doesn't matter. But if you understand why and you understand how, this makes sense. And this is actually, in my personal opinion, this is a basic knowledge item. We should all know this. But I don't think, again, it's kind of my fault because I didn't, I, when I took taxes as a, as a Mac student, I didn't, I didn't take taxes very much. Uh, again, I was going to be an auditor, travel the world, and have a, you know, have a home in every port. Um, didn't, it didn't work out that way for me. And then I got into tax. Once I started doing taxes and I started learning about taxes, this stuff really worked out. So it's actually good. So outside basis of a, of a partner contributing property must also reflect the debt relief and any gain recognized from debt relief. So if, if I contribute land of $700,000 in value with basis of $200,000, and it has debt of $100,000 attached to the land. And I tell the partnership, you're going to relieve me from that debt if you want this land. And the partnership agrees. They get together. You know, all, all the other members say, yeah, okay, we'll accept it. Boom, boom, it's good. So they accept it. I have $100,000 of relief. My basis in my partnership goes down by $100,000. But... Because I'm now responsible for one quarter of this, because I maybe I told you in this example I have four partners. Um, one quarter of that hundred thousand dollars is twenty five thousand dollars, so it'll increase again by twenty five thousand dollars. Does that make sense? If it doesn't, put a comment in the comment box below, and we'll uh, we'll deal with that. So partnership may have recourse debt, non-recourse debt. We've already kind of talked about this. Again, recourse debt. You have agreed that you're going to be personally responsible for it. Non-recourse debt, you kind of gone to the bank and said, "Yeah, if this doesn't if this doesn't happen, not my fault," and you kind of move on. All right. So usually, uh, you know, I mean, usually it is allocated by pro uh, partners profit sharing ratios. I would say ninety nine percent out of hundred, it's going to be done that way. Okay. Um, the recourse debt is going to be allocated based on who is responsible. So if if we take out that six hundred thousand dollar loan that I said in my previous example. And I go to the bank and the bank says, Kevin, we know you're trustworthy. We know your partner. She's not. We're going to ask you to be personally liable for it. All 600000 comes to me. Okay. That's how that works out. And so, so um, it gets allocated based on who is personally liable for it. Uh, basic rules for allocating partnership to debt, uh, partnership debt to partners. Again, that, you know, this, this just kind of puts it into a chart so that you guys see it. All right, partnership uh, partner contributing property secured by debt re uh, realizes gain when debt relief exceeds partner's base. Yeah, okay, so for example, I have that land, 
$700,000 of land, $200,000 of basis, I contribute it. It has $400,000 of debt. I get relief. My debt basis, I mean, my, my basis in the, pro, in the property, uh, in the partnership contribution, goes down by $200,000. The additional $200,000 of relief that I have is considered a distribution in excess of basis and is taxed at, um, and, it's, and it's actually going to be taxed to me as a result of that. The contributing partner's holding period in a partnership interest depends on the type of property contributed. Um, that is true. Uh, if you if you contribute long term lived assets and, and you know that you own for more than a year, you're going to have a long term interest in your partnership. If you contribute cash, it's short term until it goes to a year. Okay. Uh, it does. You know, again, contributing partnership tax basis holding period contributed to the property uh, carries over to the partnership. Now, if I contribute cash and land, that makes things interesting. So what will end up happening is you could have this duality area where you've got part of your basis that is in long-term status and some of this in short-term status. That is rarely going to happen, though. You don't have to worry, I don't think, too much about that happening. It, it does happen, I'm sure, but, uh, I mean, 20 years, I've never dealt with it. doesn't mean it doesn't happen. It just means, you know, I, I haven't seen it. So. so contribution of services, capital interest represents an economic entitlement amenable to measure. Uh, service part, uh, service partners receiving capital interest report ordinary income. That's the bad news about this. You contribute a capital asset or, and, or you, you, yeah, say you contribute an asset to, to get your, your capital interest and you decide you're going to do 50, 50 to the, uh, to the other partner. What's going to happen is he has to report that as ordinary income. Okay. So you want to make sure that, uh, I always tell people don't do this capital interest 50, 50. Always do it based on how much money they put in. And then that's that's going to be the big thing. And I know a lot of people, they say, well, well no, 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 no. We want this to be 50-50 down the middle. Okay, that's fine. You can do profit and interest all you want. doesn't matter. Okay? You can set that up any way that you want. Profit and interest. Go to, you know, you, you want to do, you don't want to do 1% to your dog? I don't care. That doesn't matter. There's no tax effect to that. But the fact of the matter is, is that if you put this in and you try to divvy up that capital interest, you're going to have a bad tax effect. And here's the thing. Normally, people walk in because they think they want to do the right thing. And then when you explain to them all the problems with doing what they're going to do, they're kind of like, okay, yeah, 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 Kevin, we'll just do whatever you agree with because, you know, because we're the experts and we tell them what they need to do. And then it usually helps out with them in the long run. Tax basis of a purchase partnership interest is partnership uh, is purchase price plus debt allocated to the partner. And the holding period begins on the date purchased. All right, organization startup syndication costs for the benefit of the partnership from the code. Some costs must be capitalized. We've talked about this in previous chapters. And you have organization costs, syndication costs, and startup costs. Um, I'm not going to go much into them because, you know, but if you do have any questions about these, put them in the comment box below and I'll be able to help you out. So this basically talks about, you know, uh, if, you know acquisitions to the partnership interest. Now, some of you might be saying, what's outside basis? I don't understand the term outside basis. That's the basis that a person has in the partnership. In other words, how much have I contributed? How much income have I had taxed? How much losses have I had to reduce my basis? And, uh, and so on and so forth. That's outside basis. Inside basis is going to be the basis of the assets in the partnership. Okay? So that's going to be the important thing. Uh, and they talk about outside basis, and they talk about holding period. I'll let you read this, and you can learn from that. All right, that's all I got to say about this video. I want to say thank you very much for watching, and I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next video.